Today we are going to be in John chapter 5. And uh, we are going to start off with a familiar story of the man being healed at the pool of Bethesda. And we're even going to, I'm going to have to put on my professor hat just a little bit to talk about uh, the differences in some of the texts, so I'll try not to bore you with that, but it is kind of important to the story and the fact that every time you come to a footnote where it says, uh, you know, you might have grown up with this verse being here, but our oldest manuscripts uh, don't seem to have it, that can bring on a big debate with people who say, well, it's in my Bible and that's good enough for me, and everybody else says, ah, you know, but, but I, it's actually kind of important to the story in this one, but I'll try not to bore you with all the details. And then... As I was preparing for this sermon, and we are going through the book of John, and uh, as I was preparing the first few sermons of the book of John, you get started in chapter 1, and it's, uh, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word uh, was with God, the Word was God, and, and, he, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made, and, and I began to realize, you know, John is, the Apostle John is trying to answer the question, who is this Jesus? And the rest of the world needs us to answer the question for them. Who is this Jesus? Amen? Amen. We, we need to tell everybody about Jesus. He is the one. Now, I grew up in the same kind of church that this is, uh, with some differences, but same denominations, a lot of the same teachings and everything. And I discovered as an adult that I was comfortable Worshiping God, God the Father. God the Father kind of lives in the sky. I have to, can you tell I have toddlers? Uh, <laughs> explain everything on that kind of level. You know, God the Father kind of lives up in the sky. We give him the credit for creation most of the time. And, and you know, when, when Moses lifted his staff over the Red Sea and the waters parted, you know, that's, that's God the Father. The Old Testament we tend to think of as, well, you know, that's, that's God the Father. And Jesus shows up in Bethlehem and the Holy Spirit shows up in Acts and everything. But... As an adult, I studied the Bible and I realized that I'm comfortable worshiping God the Father. I, I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But uh, when I start, we started talking about worshiping Jesus, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's the Savior of the world. But the Bible is very comfortable. The apostles, uh, the apostles bunked with him as they traveled uh, camping out from city to city where he preached, and sometimes they had a lot of money in the bag, and sometimes they probably didn't. And so uh, if anyone knew that Jesus was only human, it would be these 12 disciples, but they were very happy. As good Jewish boys growing up believing in only one God, they worshiped the Lord, Jesus. In fact, Jesus and the Lord are interchangeable, and they don't just mean the boss, the guy that we followed around, our head teacher. They mean the Lord, where if they are wrong, they are committing the sin of blasphemy because they basically call Jesus God. Furthermore, you have a couple of letters. Uh, some of the books of the Bible are, are actually private letters written by Jesus' own immediate family, including James and John, his half-brothers. And if anyone knows you're not God, I have one brother, okay? If anyone in the world knows that I'm not God, it's him, okay? And if there's anyone in the world that knows that my brother is not God. It is him. Okay, I've seen him at his best. I've seen him at his worst. And he for me. And, and the fact that James and Jude are willing to worship Jesus as God really says something. So I'm not, I, I, I had to come to a point in my life where, you know, I believe I got saved at six years old. And I asked Jesus to come to my heart because my parents were churchgoers and my dad had recently become an associate pastor at a church, and, and not only that, but they lived it at home. I got a lot of friends that were also pastor's kids, and one of the reasons a lot of them go off the rails at some point is because mom and dad didn't actually live it at home. I was very fortunate. My mom and dad weren't perfect, but they were the real thing. And so I thank God every day for that. And uh, uh, But I, got, I came to know Jesus at an early age, but I want you to understand, church, we don't just worship the great big God who we can't see and he lives kind of in the sky or something like that. We also worship the man, Jesus. And if he was here today, uh, I don't know that we would necessarily, you know, we, there, there were no photographs back then. We don't know exactly what he looked like. There, there's, a, there's a long tradition. I was teasing Michael about kind of fitting in with that tradition a little bit, but uh, <laughs> about what Jesus looked like with the Jesus beard and everything. And, 
Uh, it's like Larry the Cable Guy says, how come everybody in the church always wanted me to get my hair cut and we got pictures of the Lord everywhere looking like the drummer from Fog Hat, you know? Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, long, long hair, long beard, people used to not be okay with that. Is everybody awake? <laughs> we made coffee earlier. Do we need to send somebody for more? Okay, okay, good. Um, but uh, we worship the man, Jesus. And on top of that, we worship the Holy Spirit. We don't just ask the Holy Spirit to do things for us whenever it's convenient, but that'll be a whole other sermon sometime. In, I got a lot of scripture to get through, so I guess I better quit rambling, but, but we worship Jesus. And we're going to encounter somebody who is a bit odd. He gets healed by Jesus, and usually that involves great faith and someone coming to a belief, believing knowledge in Jesus Christ and becoming a follower of Jesus, even when Jesus goes to like Gentile territories and he rescues a guy from being inhabited by a legion of demons, that guy wants to go with Jesus afterward. Man, I'm coming with you. And we're going to meet a man who gets healed, and the first bit of trouble comes up, and he says, well, it, it was that guy. It was that guy that healed me on the Sabbath. And it's, I think it's a very sad story. It does some handy things for us. It proves to us that it doesn't depend on your faith. It depends on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the one with all power. Jesus is the one who heals. Uh, I, I want you guys to have faith. And we have started prayer meeting at this church. We are trying to turn this church around. We're going through a process we call revitalization. Uh, and, and we got a ton of visitors today, so something's working right. But praise God, we have started prayer meeting. That is not the cool thing to do in churches today. But we are going to meet together and we are going to ask God to do something supernatural. And we are going to believe in the supernatural. We're going to act like we believe in the supernatural. And, uh, but at the same time, it is Jesus who has all the power and it's Jesus that does the healing. In fact, we have a story here of him healing someone who's almost, you know, he wants to be healed, but he's kind of not really on the ball with the program. We're going to start in John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And if you're following along King James, we skipped four. We'll come back to that in a minute. Number six, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the, uh, I'm sorry, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on, on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Now we're going to finish the chapter, but I'm going to stop right there for a bit. And would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for all that you've given us, O Lord. And as we open your word, uh, even with a little bit of debate about one verse that may or may not belong in there, Lord... I just pray that your word would speak to us, that we would respond in faith like the father last week who believed that when Jesus said his son was healed, he was happy to go on home and find out, to, find out that it was true. Lord, help us not to be like this man. Help us to not be so religious like the people we're going to talk about today that even a miracle cannot open our eyes. Open our eyes to the lostness all around us. Open our eyes to a world that is in darkness and the fact that we have the light. And teach us what it means to share that light and to help those in need and to grow your kingdom, even in a place where it doesn't look like it wants to grow very much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
So uh, if you grew up in church or have any kind of Bible knowledge at all, you might have heard this story before. And like all of the stories where Jesus heals someone, this is really, really cool. I mean, the man cannot walk. And I struggle when I tell these stories to my small children. They don't know a lot of people in wheelchairs. They, they don't know a lot of, they, they got an uncle with a prosthetic leg, but that's about it. And he walks on that prosthetic leg. So it's, it's hard to uh, do what? And rides a bike to and from work, so he's doing okay that way. But, but uh, anyways, um, man, to think about the medical care that was possible back then, to think about Jesus can just heal someone. In fact, that is part of the point of the story. Now, I told you there was a little bit of debate over verse 4 there. We, uh, and and, and uh, we had a bunch of manuscripts had that verse in there. And if you're wondering, well, why would we take it out? Well, because we have older manuscripts now. And you say, now, wait a minute, we're farther away from the time period. How do we get older and older manuscripts? Well, we've been digging, okay? We've been digging, we've been working, we found all kinds of things. Some of them were stuffed in the backs of museums and monasteries and stuff, and no one had made a card catalog, you know. And so they get discovered uh, in, on, a, on a dusty shelf somewhere, and they say, well, okay, well, and they look at it, and they try to figure out when it was written down. And uh, a lot of the oldest, the, well, the ones that seem to us to be the oldest, don't have this in there. Well, is that good? Is that bad? Does it change the story at all? It changes a few things. Because if you leave the verse in there, and I'll read uh, from the uh, footnote here, some manuscripts insert, holy and park, Waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. That's what all of those invalids were waiting around the pool of Bethesda for. And I believe that if we leave the verse in there, it causes a few issues. Because, number one, do angels do this? Because if you leave it in there exactly the way it is, this gives the impression that the Bible is saying, and if the Bible says it, we believe it. Amen? It says that for sure, for absolutely sure, an angel would come down sometimes, stir the water. The angel was probably invisible, so they would notice that the water would all of a sudden start to stir around and have waves and bubble, and they couldn't see why. And then the first person in the pool after that happened would be healed. If we leave verse 4 in there, then the Bible is saying that's exactly what happened. An angel would stir the waters and the first person in would be healed. Verse 7 later, when the man says, I uh, would like to get into the pool after the stirring of the waters, but no one is here to help me, and someone else always gets in first. Number 7 is in all the manuscripts. Someone might have added verse 4 in order to help us who don't live near Bethesda to understand what is going on. I think it's okay to leave it out because if you leave it out, it's just the people there that believe that. They believe an angel comes down, stirs the waters, and they get in afterwards and get healed. It doesn't mean the Bible says that an angel comes down and stirs the waters and afterwards people are healed. I don't want to limit God. I don't want to say it's impossible that an angel did that. But this practice was very similar to something the pagans did. They had a god of healing, one of their false gods, and an unseen force, there were certain pools throughout the Roman Empire that they believed would get stirred by an unseen force, and then if you got in immediately afterwards, you were healed. And so, I don't like the idea of the Bible saying that it was absolutely true about this pool, even if someone cleaned up the story a little bit by saying, well, it's not that pagan false god, it's an angel of the Lord. And now, if God wants to do that, I'm on board, don't worry, but... But I'm happy to leave verse 4 out, but it does help explain what they thought was going to happen. And of course, if that's what everyone at the Pool of Bethesda thought was going to happen, it just highlights all the more that Jesus can heal whenever he wants. Amen? Number one on your sheet, this is an unusual healing. This is an unusual healing. The Bible does not necessarily teach that an angel would stir the waters 
but that is what the people believed. And I just want you to know that we know what the Bible says. We know what the Bible says. If anyone ever says to you, yeah, I don't believe in that Bible stuff because it's been translated from one language to another, and then that's been translated from one language to another, and then that's been translated from one language to another, we don't really know what it said. And then they'll pick their favorite pet political or sexual thing and say, you know, it probably was okay with that, but that in the time period they, they couldn't get away with it, so they put it in there. Times have changed. None of that is true. Number one, we know what the Bible has said, and there's lots of long, boring lectures on YouTube about how we can know that if you want to go listen to it. But the short version of the story is we have old manuscripts. They agree on so much that we have a pretty good idea. Even though we don't have the originals, we have a pretty good idea what the originals said. There's a whole science to it, um, and, and the Word of God is very reliable, and you cannot do that with any other book from the ancient world. You can do it with the New Testament, all 27 books in the New Testament. We know what the original said. There might be a few spelling discrepancies. There might be uh, one or two verses like this that we think someone was, had the best of intentions and tried to explain what was going on, so they inserted it. But we know what the Bible says. When you say you hold the Word of God in your hand, you are telling the truth. We know this. It's not just something we take on blind faith. This is something that lots of people with lots of de more degrees than Fahrenheit study all the time. We know what the Bible says. Anyone who says otherwise has an agenda. Um, and so I don't mind getting into a little bit of that to tell you that you can trust your Bible, even if it's apparent that the authors did not immediately go to Kinko's. Who remembers Kinko's or Xerox? Yeah. And make sure there was plenty of copies for the whole world that were all exactly the same. People had to copy these things by hand. So there's going to be some different spellings. And if there weren't some different spellings and a few little differences, it would be a fraud. So think about that. That last, uh, I'm going to start number one over again. This is unusual healing. The Bible does not necessarily teach that an angel would stir the waters. But that is what the people believed. Jesus can heal any time. As powerful as they thought that pool was. Uh, Jesus is far more powerful, and that is what the Bible teaches us over and over about Jesus. Number two, the man carries his bed like Jesus commanded, but runs into trouble with the religious authorities. On the one hand, it is difficult to conceive of someone with such large religious blinders on their eyes that when they see a crippled man walking, the first thought that enters their head is, you know, that guy really shouldn't be carrying his bed on the Sabbath. That's against the law. Now, what is the Sabbath? And, and we've learned that uh, the less church that people have and the less Bible background people have, we need to explain all these things. I'm going to try not to take too much time. But in the Ten Commandments, it was commanded that the people of God work for six days, and then rest on the seventh. There was no prohibition in the Old Testament about carrying a bedroll on that Sabbath day, that seventh day we call a Sabbath. But in the uh, 15, 1600 years from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus, some significant things had happened the Jews had become severely worried about ever breaking God's law again. And so, and, and of course, human beings always want the exact answer. But what can I get away with on the Sabbath? And, and, and you know, because we've always got to walk right up to that border and take a good look at the sin on the other side. And uh, so they had come up with all these rules, and you couldn't walk to, to walk further than such and such far would be work instead of just traveling, so your synagogue had to be so close to your house or something like that, and, uh, and you got exemptions. I've heard of modern Jew. I, I, I'm just going to throw this out there on the top of my head. Uh, you know, you might be, back in ancient times, if you were in a boat, you might have actually drifted farther than that distance, so you were forgiven if you were over water. So I've heard of some folks who on the Sabbath, they slide a water bottle under their driver's seat, and now they're over water, and they can drive as far as they want. <laughs> Isn't that great? But... Uh, uh, and, and this is what Jesus was always dealing with. And these people had said, no, carrying something from one place to another, that's work. 
spitting in the road and that spit tumbling and turning over soil, that's plowing. And so that's work, just ridiculous stuff. And, and, uh, and this man was doing nothing wrong, but he was violating the laws of men. And I hope and I pray that we are not that religious, that we could rejoice that a crippled man has been healed and not tell him he shouldn't be carrying his bed. Uh, there's a number of ways we could, things we could pick on, the stereotypes, you know. Instead of being happy, we, it's a funny thing to say on a, church, uh, on a day we have a bunch of visitors, but, you know, I'm glad there's visitors at church, but they're in my pew. Or I'm glad there's visitors at church, or uh, I don't like what she's wearing. She should be more modest. Or I'm glad this, that, the other thing. We must stop being Pharisees. They are the bad guys in the New Testament. And they were great with their Bible training, and they had many of them had high moral lives, and many of them followed Jesus but they had to leave behind their legalism, their Pharisees, their love of the rules more than the love of God. Now I've preached a whole sermon on this story and I didn't mean to, so we, I guess we gotta have invitation, I don't know. I would like to get to the teaching because I was overwhelmed when I prepared for this chapter. We all know this story, or a lot of us know this story, but we aren't as familiar with what Jesus says, because then Jesus enters into a debate with everyone who says, you shouldn't be healing this man on the Sabbath. You caused him to sin because you told him. Jesus, you yourself told him, pick up his bed and carry it. And so anyone who ever told you Jesus never made political enemies is a liar, because we are going to read Jesus answering his critics and not being afraid to make them upset. Verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the, uh, the son does likewise, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those who hear will live, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and if you do not receive, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe 
when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, to just be hit with that mountain of words on a Sunday morning is quite a bit. And even to sit at my kitchen table and pour over it and say, okay, I see that there are some threads here. John's a little bit more Eastern. He's very Jewish. He's very uh, Eastern. And so uh, how do I pull this all together and explain it? Is he making multiple points? Is he just making three points? Numbers three and four on your sheet, I have attempted to summarize what Jesus is teaching here. But basically, Jesus is sent from God. Uh, whenever they say, hey, you shouldn't be telling this man to work on the Sabbath, Jesus' response is, well, God's working on the Sabbath. My father is working on the Sabbath, and I get to work on the Sabbath. Whoa. And he sends me to do judgment. And if you don't respect my judgment, you're disrespecting the one who sent me. And when you hear my voice, if you hear it and you believe it and you receive it, you get life. And if you reject it, you get judgment. And not only me and the Father, but John, who you knew as a prophet, and even Moses, who you hold in the highest regard, it was all to point, and when I say me, I mean Jesus. I'm speaking for Jesus. It was all about Jesus. Number three on your sheet, the dispute is that Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath. Jesus' answer is that he is allowed to work just like his father. Number three, the dispute is that Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath. Jesus' answer is that he is allowed to work just like his father. Number four, Jesus cites the father as witness to Jesus' authority. Now on the face of it, come on, Jesus, don't you going to make a better argument than this? You say that you're from God, and then you point to the pie in the sky and say he also agrees that he's the one who sent me, and forgive me using that term, but that's how people who don't believe in God think of him. We can't see him. He's not going to come down here and bear witness. Jesus is like, you should know. If you knew God, you would recognize me. So he cites the highest authority, himself and God. And under the Old Testament law, you needed two witnesses to establish something. And Jesus says, we got the two witnesses. I'm telling you. God's telling you. And then he even throws in some as a bonus. John the Baptist, you guys knew he was a prophet. You couldn't ignore him. He was a wild man crying out in the wilderness dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, looking just like the prophet Elijah. Elijah. And you knew you had to deal with him because there was just something about him. And he said, follow me. And even Moses, if you'd really be paying attention when you study the Old Testament, when you would study Moses, the law that God gave on Mount Sinai, you would know it was about me. Number four on your sheet, Jesus cites the Father as witness to Jesus' authority. He is given judgment and life. Jesus gets to dispense life. Jesus is the ultimate dispenser of life. In fact, we get some nice end time scriptures in there that there's coming a day when the dead will hear the voice of Jesus. And in one verse, it sounds like if they hear it, they'll rise to life. And then a couple verses later, everyone's going to hear it. Everyone's going to rise, some to eternal life and some to eternal judgment. Do not reject Jesus. The last sentence of number four. Well, I could have read this one. He was their dispenser. He gets to dispense judgment and life. John and Moses are also cited. Number four over again, Jesus cites the Father as witness to Jesus' authority. He is given judgment and life, and he is their dispenser. John and Moses are also cited. Can you imagine? Keep in mind, Jesus was baptized and started his ministry at about 30 years old. Now I'm 41. And people that are 10 years younger than me, I don't think they know Jack, okay? I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm starting to, I'm starting to uh, really uh, 
uh, understand why some of you folks in your 70s, uh, you know, I'll never like really be that authority figure to you. I'm the age of your children. You know, I kind of get it because I've had bosses that are 10, 12, 15 years younger than me, and it's hard. But Jesus is 30, and he has a ministry for about 33 years, and he's talking to these old guys with these long gray beards and the funny hats and everything, and he says, you know, you better be careful. You're talking to the guy who dispenses life and judgment. Ooh. I think Jesus can do a lot of things. I'm worried he couldn't revitalize the church because you tell people that, they'll just kick you out, right? No, uh, Jesus, of course, is the king. He didn't look like the king. He looked like a guy who grew up in a rural town, son of a carpenter, and got his head a little too big for his shoulders, started saying things. But he's the king. And if they really knew God, and if God had been shining a light on their heart, they would have had that light of understanding. They would have said, there he is. There he is. And it's still that way today. Do you recognize Jesus for who he is? And the devil does not want you to. The devil has, he's the ruler of this world for now, and he has set up a system. He's got experts on the one hand, and he's got governments on the other hand, and there's some governments out there in some countries that say, don't you dare follow that, we will hurt you. That's the stick, you know, the stick and the carrot. And, 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 and in civilized countries like ours, he uses more of the carrot, or he says, you know, well, no one intellectual would ever possibly believe all that silly stuff. Tell you what, tell you what, you keep your Jesus as a wise teacher and someone who is great at listening to about morality, but you don't worship him as God, and we reject all of that. He is a wise teacher, and he tells us about morality, and we need to live our lives in accordance with it, but we also need our lives supernaturally changed. Something only Jesus can do, and we want that for you today.